Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sadas. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng of ThePowerRank.com. You can follow Ed on Twitter at ThePowerRankEd. We are one week week closer to football. We've got NFL talk coming up with Whale Capper, talking about Super Bowl futures. So I'm pumped to get some more NFL talk on here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. You know, Jim, this is the first show that we're recording in August, and August is game time for people like you and me, right? Like, I, I don't know if the fans really, like, people who just listen to this realize it, but, like, our lives are really, really busy in August, and even more so than, um, you know, during the season, just because there's so much right. prep and getting ready for the season. And, again, this is the first show that we're recording in August. I'm just excited to uh, talk football, NFL. Uh, I got a little college stuff at the end of the show and in, in covering the future. So, uh, yeah, just just excited that August has come. Yeah, and I had a uh, family reunion the past week in South Dakota, so I was totally out of the news loop for about four days as I was out there, and the mad scramble that occurred while driving back from South Dakota trying to, like, digest all this news that had happened was, like, one of the more stressful things that's ever happened. So that's (laughs) kind of how – that's the zone we're in for right now, but, you know, it's a lot of fun. you got to tell the family not to do reunions. No, it's too much fun. We get go-kart racing. Uh, I got yelled at for bumping on the go-karts, so uh, we got got a little edgy. Isn't that the yeah. point of go-kart racing? That's what I thought. Like bump they, people? They disagreed. I also uh, was erroneously accused, and I will stand by that until my dying day, but uh, they disagreed. Coming up uh, later on, we're talking with Whale Capper about NFL Super Bowl futures. Of course, you heard Whale Capper earlier on talking NBA. Also covers tennis, uh, so make sure you check him out on Twitter, at Whale underscore Capper. He is the host of the Deep Dive podcast. You can find him there. And we're talking about Super Bowl odds, some matchups for 2019, who he likes, to emerge from both the AFC and the NFC, and a couple of teams maybe he's not as interested in. And last week, college football week here on Covering the Spread, we talked Heisman odds with Edward Egros, and also had our college football preview with Ed looking through his numbers, what they say at the power rank for 2019. If you did not hear those podcasts, make sure you search for Covering the Spread on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, the Google Play Store, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find Covering the Spread. And while you are there, please rate Rate and review the podcast. It's such a huge help for us. We've had a lot of you do so already. So a huge thank you to thank those you who so have much. left, uh, yeah. yeah, have left reviews, have left ratings. That helps us out a ton. Uh, so thank you to those of you who have done so already. But another, another little slight request, if you like what Whale Capper has to say later on today. But at first, we got to debut uh, one of our segments. So we're going to be doing a lot during the year because you know during college football season and NFL season, we're going to make some picks. You know, we're going to say, hey, I like this is something that I like. And the following week, we're going to go back through those and try to investigate what went wrong and why it went wrong. That's called covering the past. And we have our first covering the past this week because last week I talked NASCAR and we have some results to investigate from that. Covering the past. So last week during Covering the Future, I talked up Kyle Larson and Eric Jones as win picks for the NASCAR Cup Series race in Watkins Glen. And at the time when we were talking, there were no odds posted yet. But the kind of thought process was these guys are going to close at a better number or a lower number than where they open. And that's exactly what happened with both guys. Eric Jones opened at 28 to 1 at FanDuel Sportsbook. He was at 24 to 1 when the green flag dropped on Sunday, despite not having great practice times on Saturday, which I thought was pretty interesting. But I think people realize that his current form is really good. Jones, another good race there. Seventh place average running position. Wound up finishing fourth. That's his fourth straight top five finish. His best career finish on a road course. Didn't get the win. But I felt good about that one. Kyle Larson actually finished worse than Jones. He finished eighth, but his movement during the week was much grander. He opened at 40 to 1 and closed at 15 to 1. And that was because he was fast in practice. He qualified well, the same reasons we gave for liking Larson prior to the race. He led six laps in the race because he's on a different strategy, which actually may have come back to bite him a bit. But I think that with both Jones and Larson, you know, even though they didn't win, I feel good about the process because 
They both dropped quite a bit from where they opened, especially Larson going from 40 to 1 to 15 to 1. I didn't like Larson at 15 to 1 because I thought that there were a tier of three drivers who all seemed to be at an elite level, and Larson was not in that top tier. But I think having him at 40 was super advantageous, and I still think Jones would be a good bet going forward, too. So, in this specific instance, I don't really want to evaluate my process too much. I don't want to reevaluate because I think that it actually worked out pretty well. But, Ed, I want to talk to you about reevaluating your processes in general because that's something we'll talk about here on Covering the Past. How often do you go back and say, huh? maybe this is why I missed on this bet, or are you hesitant to do so because you may just be chasing results when you do that? Yeah, I mean, I'm often hesitant to do so just because of small sample size. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to take losses. You're going to look silly. I mean, there the, are great bets in which the team that you thought was going to do great just has a bad game. This happens all the time, whether you're talking NFL, college football, or otherwise. So, so in some sense, like I'm reluctant to kind of change my process. Uh, yeah. A lot of a lot of it is because, like, you know, I trust my numbers, and obviously numbers go through a process as well. Um, I've been introducing ideas like success rate into my predictive analytics, and that's something that's slowly happening over 2018, 2019, and stuff I'll talk about on the show uh, over the next uh, half year, I guess. So the analytics are always improving, and so that is a change in my process. Um, but, you know, like if a quarterback is throwing the ball with some accuracy, if he's leading receivers, uh, and these are the type of subjective adjustments. Uh, we're going to talk about KJ Costello a little bit later, the Stanford quarterback. If I see things like that, I mean, that those are the types of things I, that kind of persist, right? I mean, uh, you know, I, I, watch, I, I try to watch the games. And um, so I guess what I'm saying is, is the, yeah, I, I don't try. I try to. You have to be mindful of small sample size and don't change your process too quickly. Um, right. Obviously, if you're losing over the course of years, then then you can <laughs> make the decision to to change how, how you're right. thinking about these games. But you know, I think especially if you're making your kind of subjective judgments based on you know good analytics, regression yeah. to the mean type ideas, uh, I think you're in pretty solid company. And and don't be dissuaded by by a couple losses. And the other thing, too, is changing your evaluation of a team is different than changing your process. And that, I think that changing right. your evaluation of a team, if you see a legitimate concern, that's very different. Right. And I think that that's a bit more legitimate, too, well, but, when you're but trying that's to evaluate also really, But that's also really hard, especially in football, right? It is. So right. It, it's a little bit easier if a guy gets hurt. Right. But it's a lot harder if a team's just not playing well. Right. Um, so because that's that not... You can't assume that's going to per you can't assume that's going to be their new baseline. Right. Exactly. So I mean, if you look even for I mean, even if you get a half season in college football, six games, mm -hmm. uh, a team just doesn't look that good. Um, you know, obviously injuries notwithstanding, but right. but it, it, that's a small sample size, and teams can often start playing like the talent level that we thought in the preseason after a rough six games. Absolutely. If you want to get in on the action and get Kyle Larson while the odds are still long, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. You must be 21 plus and present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania to enter. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Coming up next, we're going to talk with Whale Capper. Once again, his Twitter handle is at whale underscore capper he is the host of the deep dive podcast and nfl nba and tennis handicap we're talking super bowl futures that is up next here on covering the present covering the present let's welcome whale capper back into the show here on covering the spread uh and whale you do a lot of stuff we had you on to talk nba before you also do nfl obviously which we're discussing today you do tennis which we'll talk about later this month do you have a preferred sport or a sport where your ROI is a bit better? Do you lean one way or another? Just uh, enjoy all three of them. Yeah, so NFL you know, has my, uh, the, a, a, a special spot in my heart without a doubt. It is the, uh, the sport that I have, sort of the deepest reservoir of tools and, 
and uh, handicapping angles. And, you know, I've been following NFL and betting the NFL for by far the longest. Uh, surprisingly, NBA and tennis, I happen to have uh, higher ROIs, but I think that's just a factor of the fact that, you, you know, the, the season in tennis and the season in the NBA provides you so many more opportunities right. that you can pick and pick and choose your spots a little bit more carefully when it comes to the NFL and season, you know, game by game betting. Um, you know, you're, you're just uh, subject to a lot more good luck, bad luck type of decisions. And, and there's just fewer overall games to, to try to, you know, find your, your sweet spots. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's the, the labor of love of, of, be, of being an NFL better though, I think. And I think, you know, broadly people who have been betting NFL for a long time would feel the same way. And volatility is a key when betting NFL futures, too. And we're talking about Super Bowl futures for today. And that volatility is big. And it can create a lot of weirdness when it comes to betting Super Bowl favorites. So when you factor in how volatile the sport is, do you tend to find yourself betting on favorites often to win the Super Bowl? Or do you tend to stick with teams with more mid-range or longer odds to account for that volatility? Yeah, so almost certainly I'm, uh, I'm not betting many favorites. Uh, to win the Super Bowl, uh, and in fact, my my general approach is to try to put together a portfolio of a number of different teams, so that you have some flexibility, you have some options. I'm not trying to just pick one ticket with an especially great payout and ride that lottery ticket for the duration of the season. Uh, I'm much more interested in looking at sort of the lay of the land when you look at the schedule and trying to identify, okay, I think before the season starts, I reasonably think there are about four or five teams in each conference that have a realistic chance uh, of getting a one or two seed. And that's an enormously important aspect when it comes to having a future or, or just basically predicting the, the ultimate uh, you know, Super Bowl champion. You really want an inside track to get that extra bye week and that home game in, in the divisional round. That's huge. And so uh, what I like to try to do is, is try to identify, OK, well, the, here are the teams that I think have a reasonable chance before the season starts. And then I like to try to time my market entry so that I'm buying low on those teams as opposed to just taking them all now uh, and then, you know, hoping that their odds all get shorter. Because, you know, this is a dynamic market. It's going to, you know, the odds are going to change week in, week out as, you know, as wins and losses pile up. And, you know, there will be clearly there will be some games where, you know, a team that is expected to do uh, great things in the playoffs looks poor any given week against any given opponent. And if you can pick the right time to, to grab a future on those teams at those times, by the end of the year, you can have a portfolio where you have uh, you have nice odds on a number of different opportunities. And that makes, you know, that makes hedging decisions easier. And and that uh, that can help you, you know, help you lock in some uh, some profit without uh, without having to sweat it too hard. Yeah, well, I completely agree with you there. I mean, that that bye week is so crucial. Uh, I think I did play off Super Bowl odds after the the start of the play before the start of the playoffs last year, and it's it's, it's clear who has the best Super Bowl odds then, right? The four teams That's with crazy. the buys. Yeah, and crazy. Uh, so, from your perspective, like, do you prefer betting teams that are going to win the Super Bowl or perhaps the matchup uh, in the final Super Bowl? Well, without a doubt, if you are simply playing this as a means of like lottery tickets sort of approach, as opposed to trying to build like an investment portfolio, I guess, uh, the lottery ticket payouts on exact matchup for the Super Bowl is, is much greater. Like, yeah, there's there's really no uh, no no uh, competition there. You know, to the the um, you know, the the idea of getting a, a 40 or 50 to one payout by calling the matchup exactly before the season starts is, is enticing. Uh, but I mostly am looking to um, have, you know, to win the conference or to win the Super Bowl at the best possible price picked up, you know, either preseason or during the season, depending on how I think the, uh, you know, a team, you know, the price will change over the course of the season. So let's talk here about the Patriots and right, talk so about all- some specific. Oh, go ahead, Ed. Oh, I was just going to say, I was just going to reiterate, it's all about the price for you and catching that price, getting the best price and looking for that every week of the season, really, not just in the preseason. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, two, two, two seasons ago, I can give you a couple of great examples. Um, you know, it, before the season started, uh, it, you know, the Patriots were so clearly head and shoulders, the best team in the AFC that you, you know, that, that, uh, and they had, you know, by far and away the easiest schedule. They had a clear path to a division title. 
and a bye week. And, you know, there was greater than a 50 50 percent chance that the Patriots were going to be hosting the AFC championship game. And before the season started, you could have got Patriots to win the AFC for about plus 300. And that was a no brainer because you're you know, when you're making that bet that over, you know, that the season is, you know, the Patriots may have some ups and downs here, but that price is only going to get shorter. And if they are hosting a home playoff game for the AFC title, you know, they're going to be touchdown favorites. And lo and behold, they ended, I think they ended up being about five and a half or six point favorites to the Jags that season. Um, but, you know, you, you saw a pretty clear opportunity there preseason to, to kind of corner uh, a part of the market where you knew even if things went poorly, the Patriots, you know, had the inside track to get to the AFC title game, if not uh, host the AFC title game. Uh, and uh, and so that was a you know a pretty clear opportunity to uh, to grab some value there. Um, not not so sure that that same opportunity <laughs> exists this year, however. Well, let's talk about those <laughs> Patriots then, because they are currently the favorites at FanDuel Sportsbook. They are seven to one. And we know how dominant they have been the past couple of years, but there's been a lot of turnover on the team this offseason, and Tom Brady's another year older, stuff like that. Where do you sit on the Patriots relative to that number, and are you tempted to buy them while they're 7-1 to one right now, or if you like the Patriots, are you holding off there? Yeah, a clear and obvious chance to hold off this year and, and try to scoop the Patriots at a better price later. Um, you know, you look at people who have kind of done a decent job of evaluating schedules and no matter how you look at it, the Patriots have a pretty clearly bottom five, if not the easiest schedule in the league, which is wild. Um, but again, you know, they don't have to play the Patriots. So, um, but you know, they, they, they get, uh, you know, the AFC East opponents are not necessarily, you know, considered to be contenders, uh, certainly not the Dolphins. I think, uh, people you know, I think people are going to be surprised if, if not impressed by the play of the Bills and the Jets this year. Um, but, uh, you know, the Patriots, a, a pretty clear pattern has emerged over the last several seasons where they effectively treat the first four weeks of the season as an extended preseason. And they have a couple of tough opponents in that stretch. They have a, a spot at Miami where they traditionally underperform in the heat early in the season on the road. Um, you know, even their home opener against Pittsburgh Steelers is, is a game that I think people should not necessarily be counting as an easy and obvious W. Uh, so, you know, the, you could very well see the Patriots at two and two or, you know, uh, you know, three and two, I guess, after the first four or five weeks of the season. Uh, mm-hmm. And at that point, if you wanted to try to scratch some value out of the Patriots, I think you're going to get a lot better number than we have currently, because somebody in the AFC, the AFC is much deeper this year than it has been in years past, much deeper. There's clearly uh, about five teams uh, that have realistic shots at getting a top two seed. Uh, and the Patriots are one of them, sure. But, um, you know, I don't think that they're going to be wire to wire favorites in the AFC like we've seen in years past. And so you're going to be able to probably scoop a little bit of value in them over the course of the season as opposed to betting them now. Yeah, I always find it interesting about, you know, these big teams like Patriots, like Alabama and college football, how their odds change. And when I ran the Super Bowl odds before the start of the playoffs last year, the only team that had value were the Patriots. And you have to remember, like, it was the year of Kansas City. It was the year, you know, Drew Brees had such a great season. Uh, The Rams were looking so good heading into the playoffs. So it's really interesting to see them flip back and forth. And I I completely agree with you, Will, in terms of like, yeah, let's let's see what they do. And and they're going to lose some games, right? I mean, they're not good enough to go 16-0, catch them at a good price um, when things change. As yeah. it progresses. Yeah, it's um, true. So the top matchup on the board for the Super Bowl is Patriots and the Saints. Uh, the Saints are, have been a really good team since they fixed their defense a couple years ago. You have to uh, account for Drew Brees entering his 40s. What do you think about this team coming out of the NFC? Yeah, I mean, this has been a slowly growing position of mine over the course of this preseason. And we need to obviously see how things flesh out when they actually start to play the games. But uh, I'm very, very cold on the saints this year. Um, the, you know, the, the way that we've seen Drew Brees' play drop off over the course of the season, the last several seasons, as he's effectively put more wear and tear on his shoulder and his relatively small frame compared to some of the other you know, quarterbacks across the league. Uh, I think you see it show up in uh, November, December, and, and in, especially in January, where he's just not nearly as effective a downfield passer as he is earlier in the season. Uh, that has huge implications for the Saints this year. The Saints have a very, very, very tough schedule this year. 
Um, I think that uh, the NFC South is extremely competitive, uh, both the Falcons and the Panthers who have easier schedules and have kind of better setups, uh, I think will be, you know, will be very, very um, interesting to keep an eye on, especially early in the season, you know, uh, among the teams that I think, you know, I mean, I, th- I think people are, are sleeping a little bit on the Panthers and, you know, they're kind of waking up a little bit on the Falcons here. But, you know, you're talking about teams that have, you know, pretty dynamic offensive weapons and, and offensive you know, ways they can attack you. Uh, and the Saints, you know, that they've they've lost Ingram. Um, they have, you know, a relatively thin receiving core after you get by, you know, one of the top five in the game and Michael Thomas. Uh, and so, you know, there will be opportunities to, you know, kind of single out and, and take Thomas out of the game. Uh, and uh, we haven't seen Alvin Kamara really be able to handle the load beyond, you know, 18 to 20 touches a game. So it's it's going to be um, a little bit of a growing pains, I think, for the Saints this year. Uh, I, I really, really think they bungled their draft two years ago where they gave away so many future assets to move up to take one pass rusher who we don't really have really seen uh, that this guy is a game changing talent. Uh, and so they, you know, the, the last couple seasons where they've had this injection of youth that is, has really kind of lifted their potential. Uh, they're not going to have that this year. And, and so you're going to need, you know, all of your pieces to com- to, you know, conveniently take a step forward in terms of production and play. Uh, in order to kind of improve your, you know, your chances this year. And, you know, for, for Saints fans and for the Saints, you know, the, the Drew Brees and Sean Payton, you know, your, your best two chances were probably your last two seasons. And, and I think uh, the market is, is way, way, way overpriced their, their potential this year. And, and uh, of all of the teams across the NFL, the Saints are probably the team I'm most uh, excited to fade based on how the market is pricing them. Yeah, you think back to last year's playoffs. I think it was a, a deep ball to Ted Ginn that Breeze underthrew pretty dramatically. I yeah. remember that sticks oh, yeah. out pretty much. And also, I don't know if it was in the playoffs, but it was late in the season sometime. They ran a gadget play with Taysom Hill and had him throw a deep ball instead of Breeze. And, I, I yeah. you know, it's partly a gadget play, but I don't think it was entirely just because of that, honestly. So I think that yeah. I think your pessimism's, uh, you know, pretty well founded, I would say there. Does that push you towards the under on the Saints here? You talked about their schedule. You talked about how good the Falcons yeah. could be with that defense healthy again and how good uh, their offense could be with those two new offensive linemen. Are you betting the under on the Saints for this year? Yeah, that's probably my, actually of all the bets I've placed across the preseason markets to this point, the Saints team total under. And then, in fact, they're alternate unders like I, I, I would go as low as under um, under nine, to be honest wow. with you. This this is looks like uh, the type of season where just nothing goes right for them. And, you know, that the, the handful of games that um, that you would expect, you know, are, you know, the handful of games that are coin flips, they're in disadvantaged schedule spots like they, they just they were really dealt a very, very difficult hand. Um, coming off their buy, they're playing the Falcons, who are also coming off of their buy. So they've kind of neutralized the one spot on your schedule where you'd like to, you know, you look to have an advantage. Um, you know that, and uh, and then down the stretch, um, the Saints have a number of road games. They're going to have to finish the season back to back weeks on the road, week 16 and week 17. Uh, this is a huge thing that I look for before investing in any futures for the Super Bowl. <laughs> if you have a team that has back-to-back road games week 16 and week 17, they better be winning their division if they have any shot of a Super Bowl because there is no way that a team goes on the road at this point from the wild card after two weeks in a row on the road at the end of the year and then wins three road games. It's just completely unheard of in today's NFL to have that much success that many weeks in a row. We saw last year teams that looked so good in the wild card round like the Colts uh, and the Chargers travel for a second straight week in the playoffs and just get absolutely brutalized in the playoffs. And you go back and you look at teams in the past where wildcard teams have made a run, almost always they are coming off of soft home schedules at the end of the regular season before they go on that road run. So it's, it's just, it's much more, more difficult uh, to come out of the wild card if your last couple weeks in the, in the regular season are on the road. And that's where the Saints find themselves this year. So they're, they're in deep trouble with the competitive a- NFC South and, and the end, the way that their schedule has been, been set up. We're talking here with Whale Capper. You can find him on Twitter at Whale underscore Capper. And two teams that have gotten a lot of buzz this offseason and plenty of interest at sportsbooks too are the Browns and the Bears. And both teams made big leaps forward last year. The Bears the full season. And the Browns uh, late in the year after Hugh Jackson was fired. But that buzz is good. 
but it also has made the Browns 16 to one at FanDuel Sportsbook and the Bears are 18 to one. Are you interested in either of those teams at those respective numbers? Yeah, so these are fun to talk about because it's always it's always interesting to see. Okay, well, where is the book's biggest liability? You know, what yeah. what are what are they worried about? And then clearly this year it's set up <laughs> with the Browns and the Bears. Yep. And you know, and granted, if you if you got in early, you know, if you bet the you know the Browns at thirty to one, or you bet the Bears at whatever you know they opened at probably I think twenty five or twenty to one. You know, if you if you got in early. Uh, you made a good bet. You've already captured some value. Like that's the whole point of getting involved in the futures market is you want a number uh, that uh, that gets shorter uh, so that, you know, you are buying in at, you know, two, five, 10 percent win probability. And then you look up and you have 20, 25, 30 based on what the market tells you. Like that's the whole name of the game. Uh, and so, if, yes, if you bet into the Browns on the opener, well done. You've made a great bet. If you bet into the Browns now, you are number one. You're, you know, at the losing end of, of the offseason price. There's there's really nothing that could happen short of, say, a catastrophic injury to Ben Roethlisberger that would drastically change the Browns price now. Um, you know, yes, they have, you know, the most, you know, probably a, a top a clear top five roster across the NFL in terms of talent they have talent at the positions you need talent to be successful in today's NFL and yes they likely will be in the mix when it comes to playoff time so you know it does make sense to try to get a Browns position at some point um, but I think you're going to be able to do better than a number of at uh, that you're seeing currently at 16 to 1 because you know the, the Browns again you know they have a, a, a rookie head coach they have a second year quarterback they have a very 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 significant lack of depth when it comes to experience and that tends to matter come January you know we've uh, you know one of the most tried and true angles in betting at playoff NFL football is what you fade the you know the fade the the quarterback who's making his very first ever playoff appearance there, there are very few examples of quarterbacks who have never been in that moment before uh, you know outdoing their expectation they're almost always underachieved in that spot and that likely would be what we would expect out of Baker Mayfield this year uh, in his first ever playoff experience. Same with Freddie Kitchens. We have no idea if he knows how to correctly prepare his team for a playoff game. And, you know, you have a lot of volatile personalities in the locker room. All, all of this together spells, if you're hardcore Browns fan, you know, hang on for about a year. Let them kind of work through some of their issues. Let them get a little bit better. But uh, this year, I think, is a year too early to really be uh, expecting them to cash a, a, an NFL championship future for you. So, well, you talked about the Saints and how you're not high on them earlier in the show. Uh, what kind of underdog are you looking at in the NFC to, to make a run to the Super Bowl? Ooh. So across the market right now, I see value in the Eagles. Uh, I make them closer to um, closer to five or six to one to win the NFC. Wow. And they're currently priced around seven to one. Um, I also see value in the Falcons and, the, you know, it's, it's and although my gut's telling me that this is a bad play, there is a little bit of value in the Panthers. The Panthers have done it before. Uh, Cam Newton, clearly a heck of a lot healthier than we were led to believe throughout most of the off season. So there is a little bit of value in the Panthers. And, you know, when, again, I'm kind of looking specifically at schedules at this point and trying to buy into NFC teams that I think are going to have a kind of a, a soft opening spot. You know, you want to see you want it. You want to bet on a team now that you look up week five and they're four and one or five and oh, like that's your that's the best bet possible, because the market is going to drastically overreact across the first four weeks to what we see, you know, from, you know, from some of these teams and the schedules across the first four weeks are completely out of balance. You know, some teams have way, way easier schedules. You know, I'll, I'll point to the Packers and kind of use them as a key example here. Um, you know, if you like the Packers, then it makes sense to bet them preseason um, because they have three home games in a row, weeks two, three and four uh, advantageous spots in all of those home games as well. Uh, some of their tougher games, they get a little bit of extra rest to prepare for. And so even though they even though they have a rookie head coach, uh, I, I still think you're you know, you're probably going to see. Um, you know, the public kind of pick up on, you know, a little bit of momentum if they can put together some wins early in the season, especially if they beat the Bears in week one. I mean, if, if they pick up a win there, you know, that the people will kind of be falling all over themselves to jump onto the Packers bandwagon. Uh, and then they go from that game in Soldier Field and have three in a row at home, like very, very re reasonable to ex look up and expect them to be three and one or four and oh after four weeks. Uh, at which point you would have some value on that NFC ticket, I would I would believe. Um 
that goes without saying that I don't necessarily love the Packers, <laughs> but uh, in terms of kind of this approach of, of trying to find soft opening spots, the Packers and the Panthers are the two that very obviously stand out as I look at the schedules. Um, you know, aside from them, though, I do feel that the uh, that the Falcons and the Eagles are underpriced. And, well, let me uh, stop and, right there yeah, real sure. quick. I mean, what do you think about the Falcons defense? They were not good last year. Didn't yeah. really make any big additions. Obviously, they were they had guys hurt in the secondary. Um, so do you think they can get it done on that side of the ball? Yeah, that and that's, you know, two, two, two points on this. Number one, uh, defense, in my opinion, matters less for winning regular season games. Um, you're going to need that defense to be pretty cohesive to make a run in the playoffs, I would say. Uh, but for sure, they can win double digit wins, even if their defense doesn't take a, 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 an especially significant step forward. Number two, even though they didn't make any clear, obvious free agent additions, they're getting back two of the most dynamic players in past defense that that exist in the NFC. Uh, and the, you know, two without these two players, you could see last year, they had virtually no chance in stopping anyone through the air. Uh, and they gave up, you know, 30 points a game as a result of that. And that the two players I'm referring to are Keanu Neal and Deion Jones. Uh, these are kind of the prototypical players you need to stop dynamic air attacks in today's NFL. Uh, and, you know, they don't have great covered cover corners aside from these two players. And, and those guys were exposed when they didn't have the help of these two uh, in the middle of the field. And and so I would say just getting back Jones and Neal is going to be huge for the Falcons. If they can stay healthy on the defensive side of the ball, they should be significantly improved as a unit. Um, the fact that they retained Grady Jarrett was nice. I like that they gave him, uh, you know, a nice, uh, nice uh, contract to keep him sort of the anchor of the, you know, the front seven. Um, so, you know, I, I would just say just based on who they're getting back from injury, the Falcons defense is going to be substantially improved this year. And they lost the Jones and Neal of... right away, too, which makes it even worse. Oh, yeah. Both guys were done by week two, and they were done for the season. Uh, and so, yeah, they're, they're, the wheels came off so fast uh, for the Falcons last year. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, that they also, you know, on the other side of the ball, they've, they've got addition by subtraction and, and moving on from Steve Sarkeesian. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that sh- you know, even Dirk Cutter may not be the greatest offensive coordinator we've ever seen, but uh, he certainly is going to have more. Uh, impressive uh, play calling in the red zone, especially. Uh, and, you know, the Falcons, if you look at their schedule, they're indoors on fast surfaces for the first 11 weeks of the season. Uh, this is a team that is specifically built for those types of conditions to play on their super fast, you know, turf that they have in that uh, Mercedes Benz dome. Uh, and so the fact that they really don't have to play outside uh, until the very tail end of the season. And then the outdoor games that they have are against Tampa Bay, San Francisco, Tennessee. These aren't, you know, especially, um, you know, problematic spots as far as wind and weather goes. So, they, you know, they, they got a very soft schedule as far as travel, as far as location where they're playing games. Uh, and uh, they, they are going to be the kind of offense that puts up just astronomical stats, yards, points, and good luck, uh, good luck keeping up with them from a scoring standpoint. And, you know, all, all this kind of mixes together to a team that looks pretty clearly, you know, set up for double digit wins. Uh, and if they can secure, you know, home field advantage at all in the playoffs, like we saw two years ago, uh, you know, they were kind of the best example of a value play late in the season they were set up where they had just won out at home they were going to get the two seed uh and it's a team that's set up to be substantially better at home than on the road uh so you know that that's the kind of thing that you want to look out for as the season goes along is, is opportunities to to grab grab value on teams like that and you know the falcons i think um are going to impress some people this year especially early in the season so it makes sense in my opinion getting on board now yeah, and as long as uh, Dirk Cutter's not calling jet sweeps uh, on fourth and one on the goal line, he's an improvement. And we're not setting the bar very high there. So I think we're going to see some good things there for the Falcons. That was the most maddening thing I've that seen in my entire life. call all season last year. Oh, my gosh. That was atrocious. So hopefully so we're just setting the bar very low here, but hopefully they can improve from that. Uh, so that's the NFC. Any teams you see as being undervalued by the markets right now in the AFC? Yeah, so this is a, this is a heck of a lot tougher. Uh, because pretty clearly, you know, the, the Patriots have been the, you know, the class of the AFC for so long. They have by far, by far the best coach and quarterback combo. It's not even close. And, you know, anytime you have an advantage in, in the head coaching space and, and, uh, you know, you have a guy who is ex- ex- as experienced and, and as, uh, you know, as master of the game as Belichick, then you can't be discounted. But all that said, I really feel like the pit, you know, the, the rain is coming to an end here. 
uh, the turnover mm-hmm. on, you know, the turnover on their roster has just been so huge. Uh, you know, guys like, you know, Gronk and Flowers aren't coming back. And, you know, they really are going to be counting heavily on their coverage uh, to keep them in games. And, you know, they're, they're great players. Stephon Gilmore, all-time player in, you know, in the NFL, probably the best cover corner that we got going right now. And, and that's huge. Um, but on the other side of the ball, I'm not sure how they're scoring points. I don't like what I've seen so far out of their receiving core. I don't understand really why they've, you know, invested so much in their, you know, in their running back position through the draft so the Patriots look likely to uh, take a take a step back which I think opens the door for teams like the Colts teams like the Chiefs uh, and uh, the Chargers as well um, and you know you, it's tough for me to pick out a, a team in the NF, AFC North that has a realistic shot at, uh, at getting a, um, a one or two seed uh, that looks like a very you know, to, to, you know, that, that looks like a black and blue division through and through uh, you know, Ravens, Browns, and Steelers are going to trade blows all season, and and I wouldn't be surprised if the winner comes out with a three or four seed. So it's you know I'm I'm looking primarily at the AFC West and the AFC South uh, for my one and two seeds in the AFC, uh, and the pretty e- easy obvious choice in the South is the Colts. Um, best coach, best quarterback in their division, cl- clear class. Um, of all of the bets that I see at, at the FanDuel you know board right now. I have the most value on them to win the Super Bowl. I think they're at about 14 to one or so, and I'm making them current price wise at 11 to one. Um, so that's a nice little two two percent you know value on them at this current current price. Um, their schedule doesn't necessarily play into them coming out of the gates white hot on fire. Uh, they have some tough contests early, so I'm you know it's not like you you know must rush bet this right now type of situation i think you'll probably have an opportunity week five week six to get on board the colts bandwagon but um but they're the clear class in the in the afc south in my opinion and they they look likely to win double digit games and and probably have a very legitimate shot at the one seed um chiefs are going to be right there as well i was looking for an opportunity to come against them and you know, be all in on the Chargers, but with Tyree Kill likely starting 16 games this season, that offense is so dynamic, and I really can't make a legitimate case that you're going to see any regression from Pat Mahomes. Which means, you know, good luck scoring 35 points and, and beating the Chiefs this year. Um, and so, you know, it's it's probably going to be those two in the one and two seeds, but the Chargers with an outside chance to to steal that uh, that two seed, as far as I can tell you. So let's, uh, that wraps up the AFC and the NFC. Let's say you're forgetting the odds just for one second here because we can have some fun, you know, just uh, go for this straight up. If you had to pick straight up, who would you have playing in and winning the Super Bowl this year? Just like, you know, just from a, a, a if you had to pick two teams, no odds, where would you go? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go Colts over the Eagles. Okay. Based on the rosters and the coaching coaching structure of these teams. You mentioned that you um, like the Eagles. Your numbers like the Eagles. Uh, and I think there are a lot of yeah. reasons, too. Uh, what What's the big draw for you with them? So the Eagles have a head start in the NFL, in general, in my opinion, on the basis of their embracing sort of the plus EV nature of game calling. Mm-hmm. Um The way that they approach a series, the way that they approach a a drive uh, in terms of being aggressive on fourth down in certain portions of the field, like if they get past their 40 yard line, like they're going to score points on you because they're going to construct a drive in a way that they are, um, you know, they are throwing early on on downs and they are, you know, they are going they're they're taking what you give them on third down knowing that they're going to come back and go for it on fourth down, especially, you know, with a guy like Wentz, who's so capable, you know, of, of converting the short yardage situations with this quarterback sneaks and the offensive line, you know, that they have, especially in the middle there, it's, it's a team that, you know, is just, is just operating on another level as far as how they're, their game planning and they're deciding, uh, you know, to call the game. So on top of that, they have, you know, they have, invested in talent at the receiver positions and at the tight end positions. Uh, and they have pass catching running backs that make them a very, very dynamic threat through the air. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was impressive to me, uh, what they did on the defensive side of the ball last year. Uh, they had, you know, cluster injury at cornerback, which normally would pretty much turn you into the Atlanta Falcons where you (laughs) virtually can't cover anyone. Um, but they coached up some below replacement level guys, uh, enough that they were able to win games down the stretch and get the six seed 
and they went on the road and they won in the playoffs on the road. <laughs> so it's, it's a, it's a team that you cannot discount under, you know, no matter what. Uh, and I would say, um, you know, I would say that, uh, as price, they, they look to be the class of the NFC. All right. That is whale capper. We got you on here to talk the NBA before NFL's now done tennis. Just around the corner, U.S. Open coming up. So I got to thank you now. But this will not be your last appearance here. I'm Jack to talk some tennis down the road. But thanks for talking to NFL today, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks, always bro. a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're getting into tennis, you got the U.S. Open uh, run-up here with uh, a couple of really important hardcore tournaments, Toronto this, Toronto and Montreal this week, uh, and then Cincinnati next week. You're going to get a get a sense of some of these players form in North America before the U S open tips off. All righty. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon. All right. Take care guys. Covering the future. One final thank you to whale capper for stopping by and dropping some really good knowledge. I think on the NFL and uh, you know, just process based stuff. And I think he talked about that with the NBA too, where if you want to bet the Clippers, don't bet them now. <laughs> Wait until that offseason hype uh, wears off and stuff like that. So really good takeaways there, I think, from a process perspective. Let's move now into covering the future, taking a look at some future bets that we like. And, Ed, you're going to talk about uh, a place that you know a thing or two about in Stanford. <laughs> and we didn't talk yeah. too much about Stanford during the Fuller preview last week. But when you look at them entering this year, I think they're a super interesting team. What do your numbers say about them? Yeah, I mean, the numbers don't particularly like them, and, and I'll get into that. But just, just kind of covering this program over the past decade, uh, you know, it's been a good decade under David Shaw. He took over from Jim Harbaugh in 2011. They've won 94 games this decade, so that would be starting in 2010. That's five more than Oregon for, for best in the Pac-12. You got three conference titles during that stretch as well. So things are good, right? Well, maybe not so much when you look at the advanced analytics. So if you look at team strength, or essentially how this team has performed, and the way I do that is I take margin of victory and adjust for strength of schedule, you actually see a steady decline over the decade. Not a steep decline, but a slow kind of gradual decline. And, you know, it's been up and down over the seasons, but um, when you plot out how they performed over the last nine years, that's what you see. So what does that mean for 2019? Well, it means my regression model doesn't really like them that much. So this is based uh, primarily on how a team has performed over the last four years. It also considers turnovers and returning starters. Um, well, Stanford hasn't been their best over the last four years, and they only returned nine stars. So the model has them at 47th. Okay, So that's not particularly good. But you have to look at who these returning starters are. And it starts, and I'm very high on who these returning starters are. Uh, it starts with quarterback K.J. Costello. He's accurate. He's got a big arm. He's going to get a look at the NFL. Uh, the NFL is going to give him a look after the season when he's done. There's a lot of other talent coming back on offense. You have offensive tackle Walter Little, who's projected to be a top NFL pick. Um, he's the only retarding starter on the line, but at least you have a solid anchor there. Uh, they have other highly touted guys, five-star named Foster Sarrell at tackle. Uh, if he can live up to the hype, uh, the offensive line could be pretty good. You have uh, tight end Colby Wilkinson as well. The pass offense was seventh when I look at adjusted yards per attempt last year. And that's that's obviously very good. I think they can be as good again with Costello uh, leading that offense. The defense was pretty blah last year. Uh, not only they were 50th when I look at yards per play, uh, adjusted for competition, and I really say blah about this defense because there wasn't a single player that registered double-digit tackles for loss. And tackles for losses is a way of assessing talent. Like, who are those athletes that can go out and just get it done behind the line of scrimmage? They do have some talent on this side of the ball. They have cornerback Paulson Adebo, who as a freshman was first team all Pac-12. Uh, but they're going to need other guys to step up. So on offense, I really like the talent that returns. I think this is kind of a, a high upside team. And my model says that they're going to win 6.3 games, which is not very exciting in terms of betting a win total because the markets have it at 6.5 right now. Um, my model also, right now I'm having serious regrets of giving you the points, Jim, <laughs> on our bet with Northwestern. I gave you 6.5 points. I don't know why I did that. I really wanted to bet that straight up. <laughs> because Stanford the six and a half point favorite. But you talked me into the points somehow. That was a big mistake. My numbers actually like Northwestern on the side there. But what I do like in terms of the Stanford team is the division odds. 
So since last week, since we last talked, Jim, FanDuel has posted uh, division odds. So who's going to play in the conference championship game? And I think those odds are a little bit too high on Washington and Oregon. Obviously, two teams that should be ranked ahead of Stanford right now. But when I run the numbers, I have Stanford about 14% to win the Pac-12 North. And that suggests value at 10 to 1 odds. Um, so, and it was also interesting too, because we've had the conference odds up for a while and the numbers suggest no value for Stanford to win the PAC 12. Mm -hmm. So it's just in this division odds right now. Uh, there should be there, uh, the numbers see some value and, and I like, you know, I kind of like the long shot bet on Stanford just because, you know, they're probably not going to be great, but if some of these guys really perform, at the NFL level that people expect them to, they could have a really good season. They could knock off the Oregon. They could knock off the Washington and win that Pac-12 North. And I think it's important to recognize volatility where it exists because volatility can make a win total bet very risky. And you may not want to go there, right. but volatility is a positive in, in a lot of ways. And I think that, you know, when you're getting a team in a situation where you're betting them to win the division rather than top their total, I think that's a better spot to go. And if you like, if it's a super boring team that – doesn't change like Iowa comes to mind I don't I don't know what their division <laughs> odds for this year but like if 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 they're a team in the mold of Iowa and they're right. super boring and the, their range of outcomes is a little bit smaller that's a little right. bit different maybe not for this year their quarterback's pretty good uh but like just in that mold of boring maybe you don't want to bet a division odd but for Stanford where they do have a talented quarterback and they're volatile in the positive sense that's not a bad thing right yeah, and volatility is the perfect word uh, for this team. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I would think of maybe Northwestern as, as the boring team, Jim, but not yeah, this that's... year with, with the four-star quarterback coming in. Uh, yeah. I think it's a different story there. Yeah. Uh, punt to win was sure, a thing sure for a while. Are you don't want to make a straight up? Can we change it back to the straight up bet? For, uh, uh, I would need some sort of incentive. If you can no, entice I was gonna me. Give, we were going to give you odds. No, no, no. No, you made a good bet. We're going to keep it. <laughs> We're going so to keep it. I'm it's probably minus... wearing. I'm probably going to be wearing a Northwestern shirt when Stanford kicks a field goal to win that game. Oh, in the final man. minutes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I, I it's like a, it's a lose point. lose, right? Right. No one's happy at that point. It's definitely <laughs> going to be Stanford by four, and it's going to be miserable for everyone involved. Um, and that's exactly what my numbers say: Stanford by four. Absolutely. <laughs> so that will be coming up uh, actually at the end of this month. So looking yeah. forward to that for sure. My cover of the future for this week is a new sport we have not discussed yet. Not a new sport, but a new sport for us. That's golf. And uh, I do a PGA DFS podcast with my uh, coworker, Brandon Gadula, which gets me involved in a lot of golf data, looking at that pretty extensively. And when I was looking at the initial numbers for this week at the Northern Trust, Matt Kuchar popped up as being... A pretty intriguing value bet. He is 42 to 1 right now to win at FanDuel Sportsbook. This event is at Liberty National Golf Club in New Jersey, and it's not a golf course they go to very often. They played the President's Cup there in 2017. Kucher was there for that. Uh, he also played it in 2009 and 2013. So I don't value course history in looking at uh, golf stuff. But I do value course knowledge, and Kucher has more course knowledge here than a lot of guys in this field. In 2013 and 2009, what I like to do is look at the golfers who finished well in that event and see where they ranked in different statistical categories for the full season. The average ranking for the top 20 golfers at Liberty National in 2013 in good drive rate for the full season was 59th. That was their average ranking. Their average ranking in driving distance was 69th, and their average ranking in accuracy was 84th. So very much skewed towards good drive rate. 2009, exact same thing. Average ranking for in good drive rate for the top 20 there was 68th, compared to 93rd for distance, and 79th for accuracy. And what that says to me is that I want to target golfers who fare better at courses that you know favor good drive rate rather than just raw distance or just raw accuracy. And Kucher is one of those guys. He ranks 8th in this field in strokes gained approach over the past 50 rounds, that is according to Fantasy National. He is also 23rd in the field in good drive rate in that time. He is 46th in strokes gained around the green. So a really good all-around statistical profile, and he's a good putter on bent grass. He ranks 19th in strokes gained putting on bent grass over the past 100 rounds, which is interesting because Kucher has had kind of a cold putter recently. And that's led to two bad finishes. Not bad, but outside the top 40 in the past two events. But 
he didn't putt well. And Kuchar overall is a plus putter, especially on bent grass. We've seen him win. He has that upside, that potentially good volatility. He won the Mayakoba Golf Classic last fall, won the Sony Open in January. He was also runner-up at the WGC Match Play and the RBC Heritage. So he can convert those stats that he has into good finishes, which means that he can win. So Kuchar, 42-1, to 1. it's a good field because it is a FedEx Cup playoffs now, but I think that Kuchar is still a good value bet for this weekend at 42-1. to 1. I don't know how much he will move before open, but I would not be surprised, or before tee times on Thursday, but I would not be shocked if he gets down at least beneath 40. Uh, but I think that Kuchar overall, intriguing guy to monitor for this week. And any golf interest for you, whether it be just physically golfing or uh, watching or, or, pl- or betting golf? <laughs> I like listening to you talk about golf. Okay. <laughs> it's a data-heavy sport. That's why yes. I like it. Well, and there's a lot of people that have been kind of getting into golf analytics. I, I mean, I would suggest that number was maybe zero four years ago. Right. But people are getting into it with the shot data. Uh, Rufus Peabody has been crunching some numbers and talking about it on a show. Uh, Rob Pizzola is uh, a sports better that we're going to have on the show eventually. Uh, he's yeah. been doing a bunch of golf. And then a friend of mine, Joe Pita, who cut his teeth doing baseball analytics and, and wrote a book called Trading Bases. He's been doing some golf data, too. Had a really nice preview of the Masters. I uh, had Tony Finn out uh, winning. And, you know, he made the final group. So, uh, so, anyways, a lot of interesting data things going on, just like you said. And uh, Rufus actually tweets out some of the, like, live odds, too, which I appreciate. I think it's very interesting. So, uh, definitely, it's fun when smart people talk about sports that I'm interested in. And I definitely appreciate uh, guys like Rufus and Rob talking about golf on Twitter. Anything big happening for you this week over at the Power Rank, Ed? Yeah, you can get my uh, college football win totals report. Uh, okay. Get a win total for 130 FBS teams. Go to thepowerrank.com. And then my most recent episode of the Football Analytics Show, I uh, had Jim Sonis on. Had a great conversation about NFL offensive lines, Tennessee Titans, and uh, how he puts together a daily podcast on baseball yeah. every day. We are making sure my Marcus Mar- Mariota propaganda gets on as many platforms as humanly possible. I'm sure I will discuss him at some point here on uh, covering the yeah, spread we, as well. We, we haven't yeah. done it on this platform. What's going on, Jim? I'm biding my time because I think we might be talking Tennessee pretty early in the season. Uh, I think that they're going to be okay. undervalued. I, it's hard for me to bet them like season long because Mariota's injury volatility is so high, but I think in individual games where he's healthy going in, I think that's the time where I get most excited about them. So I got to pick my spots, basically, is what I'm saying. All right. Sounds good. All right. You can find Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank. You can also subscribe, rate, and review covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. And again, ratings and reviews help us out a ton. So if you've liked uh, what you heard from Ed in covering the future or what you heard from Whale Capper earlier, make sure you check that out. Ratings and reviews, so helpful. And just search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. If you have questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. And you can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. That is all we have for today. But another Covering the Spread coming up Thursday afternoon should be posted by the time you're making your evening commutes. We'll talk to you once again then. This has been Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>